which we will read all the way through and then hand straight over to uh, Dad-in-law for the sermon tonight. But Jeremiah chapter 30, and then we'll read this all the way through. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the Lord, return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words of the Lord, the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. <coughs> Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned to paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, with I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and, I'll, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable. And thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. <clears throat> Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable. For the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins are increased, I have done these things unto thee. <coughs> Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil, and all that prey upon thee I will give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, who no man seeketh after. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palaces shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry, and I will multiply them, and they shall not be a few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And ye shall be my people. And I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days you shall consider it.
Good evening. <coughs> well, it would be good just to keep reading. Maybe one time we will. We'll just read. I'd like to. I'd like you to just imagine yourself as as one of the people of Judah, a young man or a young woman, or maybe an older man or an older woman. And <clears throat> you've seen friends and relatives slaughtered. You've seen your city, Jerusalem, destroyed, burnt, um, no hope. You've seen your remaining family, friends, many, who have been taken captive by a cruel um, nation in Babylon and, and taken away. Uh, and you've seen everything perhaps that you had hoped and desired has been destroyed. Uh, and you reflect and you think um, that you deserved no less because uh, as a people... Uh, we have forsaken the fountain of living waters and we had hewed out cisterns of our own making, cisterns that could hold no water and we had persistently and consistently rejected the God who loved us. What could God bring as a word to people like this? What could God bring as a word to people living today who have seen tragedy or trouble or trial or difficulty? At some point, we have to lift our eyes and look towards the hope that we have in Christ. And in Jeremiah chapter 30, from 30 to 33, it's largely, it's not only, but it's largely a picture of a future hope that this person and this people could have. And it's not a future hope that they would even see in their day, in their lifetime. But it is a future hope and an eternal hope. And this is a wonderful passage um, it's a, a wonderful chapters 30 to 33 because right in the middle of the book, uh, after we've seen the tragedy and we've seen the judgments and we've seen the reaping of what this nation had sowed, and, and that was Judah and Israel before it, God brings this truth, this truth that he has not been caught by surprise, he hasn't been working and speaking and reaching to this nation in, in a vain hope that somehow he could fix things, but he can't. The captivity and the destruction of Je Jerusalem, although a tragedy that it was, was not going to frustrate the purpose and the plan of God and wasn't going to frustrate the grace and the love that he wanted to show to his people. So as we look at this, and, and I want you to look at this with me together, I want you to, 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 to seek to understand what God's word is saying, not what the preacher is saying. I believe certain things about this passage. I don't want you to believe them because I believe them this way. I want you to become convinced that this is what the Word of God is saying. There are three lovely threads that go through these chapters, and we're going to trace those threads. Initially, we're just going to look at chapter 30 and probably a bit of 31. That's a thread of the greatness of the sin of the people. And we see something of that in chapter 30. There's a thread of the greatness of the suffering that the people experience under the judgment of God, it was going to get worse. <laughs> so if they thought that this captivity was bad, it's going to get worse. And then, and then, mostly, mostly in these chapters, it's the greatness of the Lord's salvation. 
It's the greatness of his grace. It's the greatness of his deliverance. And the wonder of it all, it's not just a deliverance for these people, for Israel and Judah. As we'll see, it becomes a deliverance and a salvation for us here today. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing that God would communicate to this, this to us uh, so long ago, thousands of years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, that God would do this. So let me just put a little bit of a backdrop here because it, it's, it's a bit hard to follow otherwise. I just want to say something about timing here. The current exile where uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, had been taken into captivity and Jerusalem destroyed is not the focus of these chapters. And we'll see that in a moment, but it's not the focus of that. Even the post-exile, after 70 years, God had promised to bring the people back into the land. That is not the focus of these chapters. And we'll see that as we look through it. So there's that. There's a period which we'll look at called, uh, referred to as Jacob's trouble. That has not happened. And we'll see very clearly from this passage that that has not happened. So the, the, this, Jacob's distress, the trouble, the tribulation, if you like, has not yet come. And it's spoken about here. The other timing piece, if you like, we talk about often in this place as the millennium. Um, and I believe that there are facets of this chapter that speak about that millennial period. And I'll tell you why, but you need to come to your own conclusions. <clears throat> I don't want you to believe that because I have said it. Because this chapter doesn't mention millennium at all. But as we go through it, I want you to put your thinking caps on and think about how it might fit together. Um, and then, of course, the other aspect of timing, if you like, there's the current exile, post-exile, there's a time of Jacob's trouble, there's a millennium, and there's <clears throat> heaven itself. And there are aspects in chapters 30 to 33 that clearly speak about a fulfilment that's going to come finally in heaven. So let's, let's start following these threads. Okay, we start in verse 1 to 3. It says, The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. What was the name of that book? Jeremiah. Good thinking. <laughs> okay. That's the book. Um, he actually had written things down. He had a scribe write them earlier on in Jehoiakim's reign and the king decided to cut it up and they rewrote it. This is later than that time, even though the, the, uh, the, the, the writing in Jehoiakim's reign is talked about later in the book of Jeremiah. This is actually la later. So God wanted this written down in a book. And uh, praise the Lord, <laughs> we've got that record here today. For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again <clears throat> the captivity of my people. I will restore the fortunes, if you like, of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. And you may think, well, that's talking about the return from the 70 years and we'll see that it's talking about more than that. Now he starts in verses 4 <clears throat> to 9 to talk about this period of Jacob's trouble. But before we go there, we want to understand why this is happening. Right. People like to blame God. They like to say, well, why should God bring such a judgment and a distress and an oppression against a people? And it's good to take the step back first <coughs> excuse me, uh, and see that God is right and true and proper and just in dealing with us and with these people in this way. All right? So well, the first thing you read, by the way, in verse 4, that these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. This is the first hint that this is not 
just about the captivity of Judah. He's specifically talking about Israel, which was the northern kingdom, ten tribes, and Judah, which was just Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes, they were separate. Israel had already been taken by the Assyrians or over a hundred years before, a century before. And then the captivity that we read about in, in Jeremiah was a captivity by Babylon, and that was just the southern kingdom, just Judah. So here, God is communicating to these people, and he's saying, look, these are the words that I speak, not just to Judah. I'm speaking to Israel, and I'm speaking to Judah. So he's speaking to the whole people. Right? So it's not just about the captivity of Judah. He's lifting our eyes. He's broadening our vision. But why is he going to bring this distress? Well, to see that, we need to go to verse 12. And we're going to go there. I'm sorry if we pop around a little bit. At least we've read it through and you can read it again yourselves. But if you have a look... <clears throat> where it's talking about um, the rest that he's going to give. He says in verse 12, sorry, let's look at verse 11. He's just said uh, in verse 10, he's going to save them. In verse 11, I am with thee to save you. And then he says at halfway through that verse 11, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause. Thou must be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased." So why was he doing this? He was doing this because their sins had increased. Verse 15, why criest thou for thine affliction? Why, Why the complaint? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. This is a staggering thing. See, in terms of their current judgment, in the captivity, God had done it. And when we look at the judgment in verses 4 to 9, which is more severe, by the way, God has done it. I have done it. And, and just, just think about this. He's just talked about himself as the one who will save and the one who will be with them. And now he's saying, however, however, The same God who is to be your saviour is the God that is bringing this suffering and this trouble and, and, and bringing about this grievous wound, this grievous suffering. And notice what he's saying about it here. He's saying that this is all a consequence and a result of the multitude of their iniquities in verse 14. And because their sins were increased, is sin really that bad? Well, we don't really think so often, do we? And we do treat it lightly. There's no no question. I'm sure if you're anything like me, there are many times when there are certain sins that, that, that you treat lightly. If we're honest with ourselves, we want to see how lightly God treats them. Why is God so concerned? Look at the description of these people in their sin. He, he's talking about a brew, an incurable bruise. Maybe I should have Aaron or one of the nurses describing some of the horrendous <laughs> ulcers and things that they see. But it's an incurable bruise and it's a grievous wound. All right? And there's absolutely nothing that's going to heal. There's no person that can bring about the healing and there's no medicine to bring about the healing. There's nothing that can be done. And I don't know if you remember in 
the days under the law when uh, the book of Leviticus was giving instructions about leprosy, you remember? And remember the priest, if, they, if the person saw the tiniest spot come out, just a small spot, the priest had to examine it. And there were certain rituals they had to go through to check, to see if it was growing, to determine whether in fact that spot was leprous. And it was a very serious business because although it was just a little spot, it could be, it could just be a symptom of, of a canker that was eating away at the body and could be spread and transmitted to others. And so they would do these little tests, if you like, and, and determine whether it was showing the signs of something that was in fact leprosy. And if it was, that all the clothes had to be burnt, it, the house had to be cleaned, or if it was of certain material, it had to be burnt. The, the person had to be segregated from the congregation. Because this, this little spot on the hand had the potential for completely destroying the life. And it's like that with sin. It's like a, a little tiny spot that does, se- does really seem to be fairly innocuous and it doesn't matter. And yet that's not how God sees it. He can see it as a grievous wound, as an incurable bruise. And that's how he sees it in us. See, when my heart hankers after something... I kind of say, well, I, I have an interest. And God may be calling it an idolatry. A worship of something that shouldn't claim the allegiance of my heart. When I have a little, just a little look at, at a woman down the road, I might think, oh, I'm just admiring the beauty. God may be calling it adultery. It's just a little look. And I lose my temper just a little bit, and I don't even let it get out. I just keep it in, you see. And I'm bearing malice to someone. And I think, oh, it's just, it's just a tiny thing. It doesn't matter that much. And God calls it murder. When we look at the greatness and the severity of the punishment and the suffering... We can never understand it. We can never put it in the perspective unless we see the greatness and the severity of the wound. Segregating that person with leprosy was seemed a cruel and a harsh thing. They had to be cut off from their family, from their friends. They could not communicate. They could not commune. They couldn't carry on with all the, the affairs that make life interesting and worth living. It seemed such a severe thing to do. Yet it had to be done. It was necessary and right for it to be done. Now, we have the blessing today of, of medicines and that that can help some of those ailments. But you see, there are no medicines, it says in verse 13, that are going to help the ailment of sin. We may have something to cure the leprosy, but we don't have anything to cure the sin. We don't have anything that's going to do. Do you ever look at something like that and feel like you have a need of healing and deliverance? Because you've proved over and over and over again that you are impotent. Now we are all impotent to deal with that sin. We are. Sometimes though we deceive ourselves and we think that maybe... We can deal with it. Of course, in an eternal sense, only God can forgive it. And we'll see that a little bit shortly. But even in life today, as we seek to battle the temptations and the strife that we're in, we are impotent. We don't have the capacity or the will. We're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. For our sufficiency is of God. So that's the first thread. 
That's the first thread. And it's wonderful that that's all that he says about it there. I mean, he says a lot about the sin in the first 29 chapters. But the focus in these chapter 31 to 33 is not on the sin. But it, but it has to be stated. It has to be said. And God is making it very clear that he is not arbitrarily doing the things that he's doing. He's not arbitrarily working. In fact, if you don't get the sin part, if you don't understand our fall and, and the devastating condition of our lives and soul, then nothing else will make sense. The cross doesn't make sense. God's future purposes and heaven doesn't make sense. The way that he's working his plan and purpose out is, is, is working out the way it is because here at the heart we are fallen creatures, men and women, having no hope without God in this world. Well, let's move on to verse 4, and we'll look at this passage now. Because of the greatness of the sin, the suffering and the judgment is great. We, 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 we want to forget about this part of it, but it's essential. It's, 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 it's pivotal to what God is doing and working out. It's a reflection of his character. Let's read it, verse 4 to 9. It says, These are the words the Lord spake concerning Israel, concerning Judah, sorry, concerning Israel and concerning Judah. As we said, it's both. It's the whole nation. All right. Uh, for thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Just, it's a strange illusion, I suppose, for us. But he, he's just saying, you know, that the, the fear, the terror that's on the faces of these people, right? It's, it's, it's as if, a, it's, it's as if the, a person's in labour. Now, I'm not an expert on labour, but <laughs> none of the men are experts on labour, but, but it's describing people whose faces are pale, and these men are in such a state that it, it looks as if they're in labour. Boy, it tells you something about labour, doesn't it? <laughs> It's trying to describe the severity of, of what they are facing. It's, it's a picture of it. It's, a, it's an, probably an inadequate picture, but he, he's, he's painting this picture. Then he goes on to say, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Remember, Jacob here is referring to both Judah and Israel northern kingdom it is a bit confusing because sometimes in the scripture when it talks about israel it's talking about all the 12 tribes at other times in jeremiah also it's talking about just the the top 10 northern 10 tribes that were taken by the assyrians right. here he's talking about israel and judah to refer to the lot and he's also using the term jacob here which of course was the man Israel's name before he was called Israel. So here we have it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. So he, just think about what it's saying about this time of trouble. It's not talking about the captivity that they just experienced, as terrible as that is. In fact, it's saying here, if you read it, it says that it, the day, for that day is great, so that none is like it. There's not, not one like it. Matthew 24, 21, if you look at Matthew 24, it's talking about a time of trial and tribulation the great tribulation often referred to, it says that then there will be a great tribulation in, this is Matthew 24, uh, such as not, has not occurred since 
at the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. So if you've got that, this is going to be something so severe that never before has there been something this severe. If you ever sit down and read the book of Revelation, which I've been doing lately, uh, and, and you see the, the description, and a lot of it's picturesque, uh, a lot of it's difficult to, to, in, to, uh, to interpret in one sense, but what is very plain, what is very clear, that there is a period here of severe, of, of horrible judgment of God. There's no question. And if you don't, you don't have to believe me, don't believe me, you read it. Uh, from, the, from about chapter 5 and you read through, or actually probably starts chapter 6, and just read through to see what is going to happen. Right? When you read through, the, the earth is going to be so devastated, at least three quarters of the people are going to be destroyed. Now, if we had six billion population today... What's that? Three quarters, you know, about four. You know, more than four billion people are destroyed. We've not seen anything like that. Nothing. More than one third of the vegetation is destroyed. Rivers polluted. Destruction just beyond comprehension. It will be. If you want to get a sense of how bad, how depraved the sin is, you look at the severity of the judgment. Jacob's trouble. The people will cry. I was just trying to look at the verse. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? That's, it's not a pleasant part in one way of the scriptures, but it's there. It's there. And this time of judgment and destruction is, is, is something that is foreordained by God. It's going to happen. And talking about that, and, and I cannot fit this, these verses into anything else than that period cannot do it. And if you look at historically, um, after the 70 years, they ne- Jew- the, the Jews never were really returned to their land and they were pretty much scattered. They've never had a home to call their own. Never. They've lived under, uh, under the um, occupation, the Greeks, then of the Romans. And then after AD 70, the temple, uh, Herod's temple was destroyed again and they were scattered again didn't have a place. 1948, they started to be regathered. Now, I don't know how it's all going to work out, but it is, it's a remarkable thing. It's a miraculous thing that the children of Israel are returning to the land. Because the thing to recognise here is that we see here it's part of the salvation is for, the, for the nation is a return to the land. Return to the land, there's no question. Now, I know today there are all sorts of doctrines and theologies and that that seem to want to leave Israel out altogether. I don't know what you do with this. I don't know what you do. There, and there are other passages in Ezekiel 36, uh, in Zechariah chapter 14. When you look at it, you've got to do something with it. It's the scriptures. You've got to do something with it. And it's so clear that God hasn't finished with them. Romans 11, he hasn't finished with them. There's no question. 
Now, I know it may be complicated to work out all the timings, and I'm, I'm not, I don't understand all the timings. I'm not even convinced of all the timings. But it's very clear that there's going to be a judgment. Very clear. And then it goes on to say, it shall come to pass in verse 8, and we'll, we'll, we'll think about that in a bit, but um, that God is going to do something out of that judgment, out of that tribulation. That brings us to the greatness of the Lord's salvation. See, the, the sin is great. The judgment is, is great. It's severe, beyond anything, such as never was, so that none is like it. But the salvation of God is great. And most of the rest of the chapter is talking about God's restoration. And then when we go to 31... It talks about the restoration not only of the nation to the land and the city of Jerusalem, but of the people restored to a relationship to God with a new covenant. And that's in chapter 31. So there's a restoration of the people to the land. And you have a look at that in verse um, 7. To nine, which we read, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. They will no longer be under oppression, but they shall serve the Lord their God, which they should be serving all the time. But look at this next phrase. And David, their king, whom I will raise up unto them. It's not talking about the post-70 year exile. No question. No question. He is going to be their God. As it says later, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And he's going to have David, their king. Now, you could look at this as, as... the line of David, although it doesn't say that. Again, I fit this together like this, that David the king will be there in the millennial period. The reason I say that thousand year period is it's the only place I can see it can fit. (laughs) Because the time of Jacob's trouble, as you read the book of Revelation that period ends with the return of Christ and the battle at Armageddon and the establishment of a thousand years when Satan is bound. It's it's there. You read chapter 21 of Revelation, chapter 20 and 21. So that's the first opportunity that I can see that you could have this occurring like this because it has never been the case before. They haven't been returned. You look at verse, uh, reading on verse 10, Therefore fear not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed of Israel. I will save thee from afar, thy seed, and, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. And I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, not leave thee unpunished. God is going to return the verse. uh, So he's returning them to the land. Uh, In verse 16 and 17, he talks about the destruction of the enemies. In chapter 31... Verses uh, 1 to 6, and we haven't read that, but if we have a look at that, it tells us that God's going to rebuild. At the same time, in verse 1, saith the Lord, Will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people? Thus saith the Lord, The people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. And thou shalt again be adorned with tabrets, and shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Thou shalt be yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. 
The planter shall plant and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the mount of Ephraim shall cry, cry, Arise ye and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. He goes on to talk about the regathering of the remnant. And we haven't got time to go through this. We'll probably take this in a bit more detail in subsequent um, messages. But what God is doing, he is bringing the people back to the land, but he's not gathering them in a way that he's gathering them after the 70 years. Right? That, that gathering was a very partial return, and they were never really brought back from having been scattered. The other thing that's interesting about God's grace and greatness of his sal- salvation is that he's not only going to restore them to the land, he's going to restore Jerusalem. And if you read verse, from verse 18, we read it from verse 18 to 24, it, it, well, starting at verse 18, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. Now, that's elaborated in chapter 31. If you go to chapter 31, 35, um, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divides a sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall, shall cease from being a nation before me forever. It's more of a promise. If, 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 you, if, you, if the light and the night are going to stop, right, the stars, then you can consider that I'll, I've done with Israel. And what he's saying is that, that there is no way that this nation will cease from being a nation before me. And thus saith the Lord, uh, if heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Again, a confirmation that there's no way that he's going to cast them off. He will not. He will not. And behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel under the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall go forth over against it upon the hill, Garab, and shall compass about Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies, and of the ashes, and all the fields, unto the brook of Kidron, under the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up, nor thrown down any more forever. Now, that description, geographical, I'm sure you didn't get it, but that description of Jerusalem is not the Jerusalem that is there now. Nor was it what was rebuilt in Nehemiah's day. So remember, in after the 70 years, Nehemiah and Ezra went back. Remember, they rebuilt the walls. Okay? They restored Jerusalem. They didn't restore it to this. Right? This is not talking about that post-70 year exile. The only place that I can see that this is going to be the case is in that thousand year period. It won't be the new Jerusalem in heaven because the new Jerusalem is described as coming down from heaven and it's about 2,000 kilometres wide and 2,000 kilometres deep and 2,000 kilometres soft. I mean, it barely fit in the state of South Australia. Like when, so it's not talking about New Jerusalem. It's plainly not talking about at the new heavens and the new earth. So the only place that it's going to be and it can be will be in the millennium. That's the only place I can fit it. I, I'd be happy to be shown differently. I really would. But the way that I could see when David is going to be like the regent, they're going to be serving God the city's going to be restored. That's how I could see that God is at work. But, you know, more wonderful than all of this, I mean, God is going to restore these things. He's going to do it. But what was the real problem? Why did all this start? Where did it start? Where did the sin start? 
It was a broken relationship with their maker. And this, the greatness of the Lord's salvation is not just the greatness of how he's restoring a nation to the land and how he's re rebuilding a city. It's his rebuilding a relationship with the people. And we have to go to chapter 31 to see that. We get glimpses in 30, 30 verse 9 that says that they will serve the Lord. And 30.22 says that you shall be my people and I will be your God. That phrase is echoed in a number of places, and particularly when it's talking about the new covenant and the new administration, if you like, whereby we relate to God. I will be their, their God. They will be my people. When we go to 31, uh, chapter 31 and 30, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, the whole nation. And not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and, and not according to the Mosaic covenant. And he goes on to talk about the Mosaic covenant. The covenant that they had broken. The law that they had sinned against. In verse 33, this covenant shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts in their hearts Ezekiel says a similar thing I will give them a heart of flesh and not of stone and I will put my law in their inward hearts I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people it's about the restoration of relationship. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Aaron's going to get us there, so I don't have to talk about that. Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10 refer to this passage. Verse 17 of chapter 7, 17, I will... Remember their sin no more. And he talks about the covenant. And in chapter 8, he talks about the fact that, that, that the old covenant wasn't sufficient. It's not that it was bad, but it could not deal with our sin. There needed to be a new covenant, a new basis of relationship. And that's what he's talking about here. So that we will have God's law in our inward parts. So that we're no longer under the impossible constraint of keeping all the law of God. Remember the cure that he said we could not accomplish in chapter 30. We couldn't accomplish, we couldn't have even prevented ourselves from experiencing the sin. We are fallen creatures. We're depraved people. So how could God do this? This, this just makes his salvation so wonderful, so remarkable. This covenant ha has not completely been fulfilled yet. It's not finished yet. Because... If you look at this thing, they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the... Again, I can only see that that's going to, that's going to become, see, uh, what shall I say, an expansion of the fulfilment, if you like, in the millennium. But today, we do have the restoration of the relationship. If you're a non-Jew today, and I think most of us are, Romans chapter 11 says that we have been grafted in. I don't know how God has done this, but this is a wonder of wonder. This new covenant, when you look at the New Testament, is a new covenant that engages us. It's not just for the nation of Israel. And this new covenant was established by blood see the time of Jacob's trouble was, was 
something that was never before experienced, or, sorry, never will be experienced before or after. It's a huge trial. But there was a greater tribulation. There was a greater suffering than all of that. And that was when God in the flesh hung on the cross. That was when God became a child and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was greater than that, that Jacob's trouble, the trouble that our Saviour experienced. See, there was no way that we could cure that sin. There was no way that we could cure the wound. And we all know that. And God here, right back, two and a half thousand years ago, is saying, I'm going to make a new covenant. The old covenant, Hebrews told us, has been put away and the new has been established now so that we can draw near to God by the blood of the everlasting covenant. So that when Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree, when he suffered that penalty, we could have hope in him. Christmas is a wonderful time to reflect on his entering the world. But doesn't it become far more significant when we think of the broad sweep and scope of God's purpose? And how the severity of our sin led to a severity of judgment and suffering. And more of it we're yet to see. But beyond that and above that is the greatness of God's salvation. For anyone who would put their trust in him. And I'll finish off with those two verses. They were back in Jeremiah 17, verse 5 and verse 7. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. And verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. That's the basis of our restored relationship. When we call upon the name of the Lord, and our hope becomes firmly planted in Christ, who alone can lead us through to an eternity with him. Praise the Lord. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for um, the wonder of it all, and we're thankful that there is a hope. We do pray that for anybody here who is unsure, who is struggling, uh, with this whole issue of their relationship with, with yourself, we do pray that you'd bring understanding and bring light and bring conviction and there would indeed be a response, a crying out to the God who alone can deliver us from the just penalty, just consequence of our sin. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.